We're here for today in this session is to look at some of the Bodo principles of uh, Masaki Yatsumi uh, and some of the sayings uh, that he mentions about floating in your walk, using your spine, the way he uses the body, uh, looking for your own limitations in movement and learning to overcome them, embracing nature and natural principles. And all of his movements come from that natural core. Uh, and in the West we seem to be hung up on this inner core. So we're going to look at some things tensegrally and, and anatomically to explore some of those or explored some of those myths uh, and give you a better understanding of natural movement principles so that most people can then move in a more natural and uh, effortless way that helps to maintain the body. So we're gonna, that's what we're here for this morning. A man called Grekovensky uh, came up with a, a theory called the spinal engine. And, if you stole that, please. and basically what he, he found was that we, we don't actually walk from the pelvis and we don't walk from our legs. That requires strength. And so legs came way after our limbs from evolving a totally different kind of spine to become a land animal, we had to learn to have a lordosis in the spine, which is this natural curve here. And Grekovetsky showed and demonstrated that if you turn the thorax, it produces a spinal engine that actually makes the, pen, the, uh, the axis of the pelvis move as well and gives you pendular action to the legs. So he called it the spinal engine and still talks about the inner core and the pendular action of the legs and the, the force feedback coming from the floor as well. Hatsumi says the spine is all the way through the body and the end of your spine is actually your toe. And when he explained that to us at first, it was, it was uh, difficult for me to understand. It took me a lot of years to understand some of the things he did say on the level that I hope I understand now. And Tensegrity will give us some of those answers. So Hatsumi would constantly quote about his movements in the dojo as, uh, use your spine uh, before your feet. You must learn to float in your walk. So these are some of these concepts that trying to understand them was difficult. And you see people studying with him for many years and still not getting those principles exactly right. Uh, and I met uh, Dr. Stephen Levin about 15 years ago and his principles of biotensegrity just intrigued me and I started to look at his principles and said this is an explanation of how you can float and you walk. Um, so I've, I've attended many lectures and, and done various interactions with him uh, to get a better understanding. Here's some of his models. Uh, a man called Tom Fleming makes these, makes these models in a biotensegrous way. Biotensegrity is, is, is the tension integrity of the body to maintain its upright structure effortlessly. So we look at this inner cord, that we need strong abdominal muscles to hold us up. If we're properly poised, then we stand up very, very easily. We move very, very easily. So the concept of ancient man would have been to swim, to climb, to wade in water, to pick berries from the, the sides of rivers, to put things over his shoulders. He'd probably pull on ropes, he would dig, he would claw, he would crawl. So his musculature evolved according to the principles of Wolf's Law and uh, Davis's Law, that the body will evolve to those pressures that are imposed on it. So if, if you needed really big biceps or really big pectoral muscles, then we would we evolve, evolve them. But natural swimming, natural climbing, natural movement doesn't make those muscles bigger. In actual fact, if you develop your abdominal muscles too much, it actually stops the spine from rotating. And so you can't get this spinal engine working anyway. So you look at that concept. And you look at Hatsumi, who is now age 85, and his movements are still effortless. They're omnidirectional. They're totally unpredictable and they all have one uh, potency about them, and that is the, the, the relaxed state that he's in. It just, everything's just moving around him, and, and he's influencing that sort of uh, biosphere, if you like. And when you look at the tensegrity of the spine, this model was made by Tom Fleming, and what happens with the biotensegrous unit is if you squeeze one part of it, the whole of it changes shape. Now, if you get something in hard, in uh, normal matter, if you flatten something, it, it, it gets wider, and if you stretch something, it gets longer. With tensegrous models, no, none of the parts actually touch. They're all in suspension. And you've got inner forces pushing out, and you've got outer forces pushing in, and it's totally reciprocally balanced. So everything's at zero in here. So there's no joints. They're called pin joints. They're called nodal points. And our bodies work in a similar way. But in the West, we have this concept that we, we actually work from a fixed point lever system, which requires contraction of one muscle and relaxation of another. The concept in tensegrity is there is only one muscle with many, many connections through the body, not separate names such as a quad or a sartorius or a pectoral muscle. There's simply one muscle and it runs in helicular patterns around the body. And so as those muscles co-contract in different areas of the body, they can produce movement very naturally. 
and they, they produce it through helicular movement as well and spiralic movement. So that's part of what we need to be studying. So when we look at look at the pelvis in tensegrus terms, we see this kind of string model. So this is representing this part of my pelvis, and this would rep represent my legs, obviously. So if you've got a pendular movement and it's reciprocal, then one movement accentuates the other one into motion. So we don't need a muscle to be working in isolation and another muscle contracting oppositely. The whole body is antagonistic and contralateral to itself and therefore cancels these forces out, produces this, this movement. So if we take this model and lengthen it, so we've now got the upper thorax on it as well, when we need to breathe, our lungs need to expand. So we need to laterally, in, in all directions, expand the ribcage the diaphragm needs to move, the organs need to move, so it has to expand in all of these movements at, at the same time, as well as walking. So if this was representing the collarbone, this was representing the, the base of the pelvis, then you can see that you're walking with the spine around a central axis, and that produces pendular motion. The different view that we have in tensegrity of our joints is that this ancient Jacob's ladder produces a reciprocal tension between the two members. So you can actually hold a block in poise, in between, say, it's, it's flexion or its extension state. It can be just held in poise, and so there's no touching. And when it actually starts to work as a Jacob's ladder, the tension just changes, and that part drops, and then the next part drops. And if you can see the spine like that, as a totally segmented unit that works as one integrated uh, part, that everything is, is in your walk. And this is one of the concepts that Atomi says, everything's in our walk. Now, when, when he said that the, the spine ended at the big toe, one of the things I had difficulty with was, again, understanding the compressive forces around the icosahedron. And Tom Fleming explained the way he makes these models. So this is an icosahedron, which is the closest packing of biology and uh, the way to, to uh, cancel all the forces out. But when you make one strut longer, that can represent the femur, this can represent the lower leg, and this can represent the, uh, the foot, then the tensegrity doesn't change with the length of the limbs, and that's starting to make a lot of sense. And also the way we displace weight through the foot, through what we call the trilateral, which is three arches, trilateral equilibrium of the foot, then we can, we can displace pressure vectors and get returning vectors, which is called the pulse of the, the anatomy of walking, back into our body. And so all forces are acting to the floor in, in a tensegrus model, so we're actually never pulling towards the body, we're always pulling towards the floor. Once you understand that, you can actually use the floor to help you move around in this three-dimensional space. So basically these strings would represent other ligaments or muscles that would help to turn and co-contract the spine. Now when you've got curves in the spine, the law of the flexible rod, which is a law of physics, points out that if you side bend across an existing curve, then you get rotation. So as you get rotation in the spine, it has to send a vector up the spine and the occiput sends one down the spine. They limit themselves at about the shoulder level because the head needs to be free for our eyes, ears and equilibrium mechanism, which keeps us maintained and balanced on looking around, with a balanced jaw, which is our primal need before we even evolve the spine or limbs. People do sit-ups uh, to try and get the transverse abdominals like this and, and they do back arches and different muscles in isolation to strengthen this inner core. And yet because it works as a whole integrated system, uh, it, 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 you, you can't selectively strengthen the muscle and make sure that you've, you've got it counterbalanced all the time. Whereas if you're doing natural movements, it'll never be any stronger than its counterpart needs to be. So that's a very important concept as well. The other uh, concept inside the pedestrian model of walking is that the, the and, and this is my view of the way Westerners walk because we have that pedestrian model, is that we walk with our legs and the forward leg, we break balance then, the forward heel strikes the floor. And the, the, the model is that we, as we strike the floor, we generate a pulse or a return of energy coming back up the spine that gives a propellant to go to the fulcrum of the big toe in that concept that allows the other leg to step through and then repeat that. So you're constantly going from balance to breaking balance, catching it with the opposite foot, coming with the toe off and making, making those movements. When you look at the way Hatsumi walks, he walks, uh, he carries his centres of gravity in a totally different way. And in the Budo, there's three different steps. So you've got a decisive step, which we possibly bone breaking. You have an evasive step where you've got to there and you've had to move around it. And you've got an explorative step where you might be finding something on a person. So all of those three uh, come from the concept that you can't be, be falling to find that. I can't fall and then start being exploratory. I've just lost my core. 
Do you understand that? Because I've lost my poise. So the second I lose my poise in my core, I'm weak, I'm predictable, and I'm falling. So that again is, is, is a different way of moving. So if you're going down like this all of the time, your body's in a state of balance because you're not losing your poise. So I watch people weeding like this in the garden and it'd be so much better with just a little mat under the knee. And change, I encourage people to change legs, to keep the hips open and work everything equally. And you'll see that when we come to the martial part, that we've got to be totally ambidextrous in this art. Uh, and I think everyone should move to, much more towards an ambidexterity uh, with some of the exercises I'll show you in, in a moment.